Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Holding Space, How to Start and Continue Conversations on Race, Equity, and Inclusion. I'm Gloria Blackwell, AAUW Senior Vice President of Fellowships and Programs, and we're so excited to have you here with us this evening. We first like to start off by thanking our friends at GEICO for sponsoring this webinar on this very important topic. We want to get started first with a few housekeeping uh, tools. First, to let you know that the web webinar is being recorded, so you don't have to worry about taking copious notes. It will be available on the AAUW website. We'll also be sending out Dr. Jackson's full PowerPoint presentation to everyone who registered for the webinar. If you lo look in the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a chat box. Our AAUW colleagues are assisting Dr. Jackson and I this evening and can respond to any uh, questions that you have that are technical in nature. Please put those in the chat box. There's also a question box at the bottom of your screen. I wanna thank everyone who submitted questions prior to the webinar. We really received a bounty of questions. Uh, and Dr. Tahari has reviewed those questions and we'll be addressing them at the end of the presentation. Thinking about starting and continuing conversations on race, equity, and inclusion. Not only are we in the midst of uh, a life-changing and world-changing pandemic, uh, where people in companies and organizations are also thinking and talking about issues around race, equity, and inclusion now more than ever. We know that protests have taken place in all 50 states as well as globally uh, against the uh, police violence and the killing of unarmed black and brown people. Uh, so it's really a double pandemic for, for people of color. Um, who are also the majority of essential workers, um, especially women. We see that racial justice reading lists and book clubs are abounding as people want to learn more. Uh, people want to know how they can become better allies. People also are interested in how do I have these conversations without offending uh, my friends or colleagues or even my own relatives, and also are looking for insight but how can we have these conversations and will they be effective in really shifting issues around racial inequity at the core? Um, and what do we need to consider as we enter into the, those conversations? That's what we'll be talking about uh, this evening. But an important thing that we should also note is that one webinar and one conversation and one book is not going to do all of the work. The people really need to make a, an intentional commitment uh, to move this work forward. So joining us today is Dr. Tahari Jackson. Welcome, Dr. Tahari. Hi, she is uh, one of our storied AAUW folks. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Dr. Tahari is one of our story AAUW Fellowships and Grants Award. Uh, AAUW, for those of you who don't know, uh, awards over $4 million annually to women uh, at the graduate level, as well as community-based organizations focused on education and equity for girls and young women. Uh, Dr. Tahari is also a selection panelist who does some of the hard work of helping us select our wonderful fellows. So she is the founder and tone setter in chief, which is a great title, of Dr. Tahari Consulting. She's a certified trainer of diversity trainers, a federal EEO counselor, a sexual assault harassment uh, response coordinator, and also a 17 year veteran professor and expert consultant, most recently at the University of Maryland at College Park, as well as the National Defense University. Dr. Tahari Consulting is committed to helping you do your best work in peace by empowering people-rich public and private entities in their training and professional learning plans, goal setting, forward planning and strategizing organizationally through an inclusive belonging-based lens. Dr. Tahari will share her expertise with us, lead us through the topic in hand, and then address uh, some of the questions at the end. 
So once again, welcome Dr. Tahari Jackson. Thank you. I'm so to get honored. started, uh, I wanted to first ask you, thank you. I wanted to first ask you, so uh, undoubtedly you've seen an increase in demand and inquiries for your uh, services and your expertise from companies and organizations wanting your services. Do you really see a, a doubling down and an emphasis on diversity, equity, and, and inclusion as a long-term focus, or you think some of it is some of it just lip service? Wow, that's 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 the question. That's the sixty-four million dollar question. So I'll just get right to it and say that um, as someone who is who identifies as multiracial and mixed with black in these United States of America. Um, I worry that in this moment, we actually are having, are seeing more temporary allies as opposed to permanent partners. Um, we are not looking for temporary allies. We're looking for permanent partners. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, we have been fighting the good fight of anti-racism and anti-sexism and anti-homophobia and all these other isms for a long time. And so what I think is old about this is that we still have to fight, right? I've got some images later in my presentation where people are holding up signs saying, it's, you know, I was protesting against this in the 60s and I can't believe I still have to fight for this. Like, that, where is the progress? But I do think there is progress. Um, I do think there is progress. So um, I was a little, you know, concerned when I saw a, 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 a big company like Google say, well, you know, because of COVID and because of the global economic response, we're actually going to be drawing down our diversity, equity, inclusion efforts. I mean, I, that, that really frightened me because I worry that institutions are going to use the economic impact of COVID to, to defund already very vulnerable, very lowly prioritized diversity programming in their organizations. And that's actually quite literally the opposite of what we need to be doing at this time. Um, so, so I have a mixed response in that, yes, sometimes it can feel like lip service because if a company doesn't wholeheartedly di embrace a diversity efforts, it can seem like sort of the flavor of the month and it can lose traction. And if you don't translate this dialogue into action, then the people who are marginalized in that space or even the people who care about equity and justice can feel um, really miffed after that, after it just translates into nothing. But I'm also deeply hopeful, and I'll talk about some of those ways, some of the, some of the reasons why I'm hopeful, um, but I'm also hopeful because this moment is very different from other moments, um, at least the moments that I've lived through. Um, so, so I'm hoping it's not lip service, and I think we've got good evidence that it's not. Thank you. That's, that, that's really good to hear. You know, we all figure it's a mix of both, right? Those who are doing some performative racial justice work and those who are really hopefully going to be in it for the long haul. Uh, the other piece is uh, we all know that these are deep-seated, uh, you know, structural and systemic issues um, that our society is built on. And so many people are now just figuring out or acknowledging that they exist. Um, but what we really are looking for is a seismic shift. Um, one of the things that we clearly talked about in preparing for this was uh, reframing the conversations around race, race equity and conclusion. So I'd like for you to just go right ahead and start your presentation. Great, great, absolutely. I, because I just thought, oh, this is a great segue because I'm going to address just this issue. So, so, um, so we can actually just head to the next slide. Uh, thank you so much for advancing that for me. Um, so, the very first thing I want to do in this moment is just to acknowledge the moment. Okay, um, I, I already mentioned that I am. I identify as multiracial. I identify as you know, I'm, I'm mixed with African American, and so many of us as people of color in this moment are putting on makeup. We are getting dressed. We are coming to our computers. Those of us who are essential workers are going to our jobs and we are dying inside because we were experiencing a multitude of pandemics before these pandemics. So I just want to say to the listeners in the audience of which I, I believe there are about 1500 of you, thank you for any amount of time and attention you can dedicate to this because I recognize that these are bizarre and challenging times because if they're bizarre and challenging for me, and if my racial battle fatigue, my woman battle, battle fatigue is at its zenith, 
then I can't imagine how some of you are coping. But I just want to acknowledge what we're facing in this moment. We're obviously facing a global health pandemic, and that is affecting disproportionate numbers of people who experience poverty, people of color, women, working parents, right? There are some minoritized groups that are being re-minoritized by the pandemic itself, and, and that's an issue. Um, we have had an ongoing pandemic of racism. There's an image that says racism is the pandemic, right? And that was ongoing. That was unresolved. Um, for those of us who are working in university spaces and even classrooms, because I started my career as a classroom teacher, one of the most heartbreaking things that I'm learning about how teachers and educators are, are dealing with this pandemic is that they're writing things like obituaries and advanced directives and, and wills because they, they're having to choose between the preservation of their lives and their careers. And so we're, we're dealing with the pandemic of, of, of education and how to reopen safely, if at all. And then we're dealing with a pandemic and how it's affecting the, the election. Um, we all know that uh, 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 by, by presidential candidate uh, Joe Biden is looking not only to get a woman on his ticket as his vice president, but also a woman of color. And the way they're being vetted and how some of them are being positioned as too ambitious, it's reminding us, it's re-traumatizing many of us um, with regard to the pre-existing pandemic uh, of sexism. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, I am a perpetual optimist, and so I just want to also acknowledge the power and the promise of this moment. Um, on the upper left, you'll see that wall of primarily white women and white people who were standing in solidarity with protesters, not rioters, protesters in Kentucky. We're seeing wonderful things from Wall of Moms in Portland. If you see that image on the upper uh, right-hand corner, there's a, a white woman that has a sign that says, White Moms for Black Lives. Um, you know, because this is a moment where even white people are quite outraged and particularly white women, um, which is a key demographic in any election, right? Black women also make the difference in who's elected, but white women, you know, overwhelmingly, uh, um, unfortunately, um, showed support for President Trump last time. And so it's important to get white women, especially white educated women on board with any uh, social struggle because their impact is huge. Um, one of my favorite, more amusing, and we can have a separate conversation about the wording, but but this is a woman named Karen, and she's saying Karen against police brutality, Karen against racism, because there's an entire dialogue um, around uh, around around racism. And then finally, I've already sort of uh, addressed this woman who somewhere in the world there's a lidless steri a sterilite container, um, and there's this woman and her black magic marker, and she's saying I've already protested for human rights, for civil rights, for women's rights, um, and I can't believe I've had to come out and do this again. Um, so I just want to talk about how this moment, even though we're fighting some of the same pandemics that seem unresolved, we are also making extreme progress because so many people are outraged and so many people are looking for permanent solutions and to be permanent partners and not temporary allies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, as a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging consultant, I was doing this work prior to the pandemic about this state and this trend of white people calling the police, right, on people while they were doing any number of things while black. Um, next slide. We had the woman out in California who called the police on the picnickers at Lake Merritt, right, which is a gentrifying area around uh, Oakland and Richmond Complex. We had a white woman who, who called the police on black uh, hotel goers who were swimming in their own pool and they were forced to show their card. We had a, a white gentleman call the police on a black woman uh, for using a coupon he didn't recognize. And then, of course, we have more famously Amy Cooper, um, who actually uh, called the police on one of my classmates. Uh, he's Harvard class of 84. I'm class of 2000 and 2001. And uh, just a black bird watcher who's trying to get some compliance to a leash law. So I just want to make the statement that we had a pre-pandemic pandemic, right? So what's interesting about this moment is that we're gaining momentum on needing to address racism in a more serious and urgent way, but we needed to feel that way even before George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. The only difference is that those things were recorded and in your face. And so now we're just, to some people are sort of waking up to that. Um, I don't like to actually use the word woke because if you've already arrived, you're not going anywhere. So some people are waking to the pandemic of racism specifically. Uh, next slide. 
So I just want to say before we sort of get into some of the ticks and tips and tricks and strategies, which is what people really come to these for, like, what do I do tomorrow? I have so many people who say, thank you for your wisdom, but like, what do I do at work tomorrow? Or what do I do in my family tonight at the dinner table? I just want to acknowledge that one of the wonderful teachers that I was interviewing, actually as a result of some of my grant funded research through the AAUW, talked about how in order to do good social justice work, good equity work, we have to first do deep personal identity work. So when I lay out some of the frameworks that I'm going to discuss this evening, they apply to us as individuals personally, and they also apply to us organizationally, right? And professionally. So I just want to sort of keep, I want you to sort of keep that in mind because there, there will be things that you can latch on to personally, and there will be things that you can hopefully use within your spheres of influence at your places of work, your places of faith and worship, and in your own home. Next slide. Okay, so the first thing I think that it's important to lay, lay out here, especially with regard to how I do this work, um, I want to talk about some of the guiding edicts behind this work because um, anti-racism work is uncomfortable and difficult, anti-oppression work, anti-sexist work, any work we do where we're challenging a patriarchy or a norm or some sort of status quo is inherently uncomfortable. And I just want to make sure that you know how, how I'm thinking about this work before we even embark on that together this evening. So I just want to acknowledge that at any given moment, we're all doing the best we can with what we know, okay? I have no business being in education or even a consultant for that matter if I don't believe that the most intractable, intransigent, obstinate person or organization can't change, right? And secondly, I really do believe that people are capable of learning, growing, and changing until the moment you pass away. I used to say until the day we die. But I actually had an opportunity to watch my father physically pass away and how he could, you know, intuit new information and learn a new nurse's name right before all of his organs shut down. So even if we, you know, decide to embark upon this work and we get frustrated and burned out at people's lack of progress or even our own lack of progress, we need to understand that we are going to be doing this work for the rest of our lives, right? There's always progress and there's always a fight and a struggle to participate in, but we're going to be doing this work long longitudinally. And I need you to get comfortable with the idea that if we're looking for seismic shift and seismic change, that's going to take a while. Right. Um, thirdly, uh, I just want to acknowledge that everyone is an expert on themselves and their own experiences. Right. Only you know what it's like to be in the body that houses your soul. This is the body that carries around my soul. This is the outward facing public non hideable uh, identity that I have. And so I am an expert on what happens to this body. Only I can tell that story. That story is mine to tell. And it's incontrovertible. And so I just want to say that as we move forward and do this work, I recognize that everyone has a story to tell. And it may or may not, you know, be the same one. The penultimate point, which is so funny to even have to put on a slide, um, is that human beings aren't better than other human beings. And I hate that I even have to remind us of that, but in every society and in every organization, we have figured out a way um, to, divert, to, to sort of stratify right? And to say that these humans are better than these. If we're thinking about leaders, we should probably have a man. If we're thinking about, you know, promoting someone, they should probably white, be white. If we're thinking, you know, we're always thinking about stratifying ourselves. And I'm just here to remind us that human beings aren't better than other human beings and that we truly are sort of all in this together. And then finally, I just want to say there's a question at the end that I'll address about sort of safety and psychological safety and professional safety, how to bring these issues up in a family, um, in your organization, in your place of worship. And the thing that I want want to say is, you know, if you ever lose something like a job or an opportunity or a relationship because you stand, you stood on the right side of justice, you still will never lose any sleep. It's always the right time to do the right thing. Your morality is not for sale and your conscience needs to be clear at night. So if you lose something as a result of standing on the right side of, of justice, especially with regard to anti-racism, I promise you that it will be worth it. OK, next slide. So now I want to talk more about how I address this work. And this is where people and organizations really get stuck. So I'm going to take some time to sort of write this up and publish it and make sure people can read this more widely. But I want to talk to you about reshifting your gaze. OK, I think and what I found in my 17 years of being a researcher and an academic and a professor and also a consultant is that organizations and even individual people get stuck on what I call the downward gaze. 
This is when you focus on the very people in your circle or in your organization who are already minoritized. This is when you get all the women together and say, we're going to have a training on how to deal with sexual harassment, as opposed to having a training with men about how not to sexually harass. This is where we round up all the African-American people in our organization and just sort of ask them what's the wrong, what's wrong, how they're feeling. Um, and then we're going to get them to come up with a plan for how our organization can improve. We're going to task them with doing all the work and then they're going to educate us. And in addition to the work that they have to do every day for a salary that is probably 75 to 76 cents on the dollar compared to the white men, we're going to also ask them to be internal consultants because we either don't want to invest in consulting or we don't, we don't take this work seriously. So I think people and organizations get stuck here. Individuals get stuck here by looking at the TV and saying, yeah, there's a pride parade or there's a Black Lives Matter protest or there's the Women's March. I hope you figure it out because my life has nothing to do with that struggle. If I don't identify as a woman or as black or as minoritized in any way, I'm not a part of that. And so that also is part of the downward gaze. The way I do this work is that I try to get people and organizations to shift to what I call the upward gaze, which is when you work with the people in an organization or within yourself along lines where you have the most power. When it's time for me to do anti, you know, to do homophobia work, I actually work with straight people because they have the most power to create homophobic conditions. When it's time for me to do anti-sexism work, I actually go for the men because they have the power to oppress women, right? And also to actually serve as allies and what I call accomplices. And most importantly, when it's time to do anti-racist work, since this is a talk about race, equity, and inclusion, I go for white people because white people have the most racial power. So this is how I do this work. Now, on the next slide, there are a couple of other gazes that we really need to think about as well, but I'm actually going to focus on getting us to reshift to the upward gaze this evening. But I want to tell you, uh, actually, next slide, please. I want to tell you also about the inward gaze which is the which is when you look inward at yourself there's a whole talk that i do about the deep personal identity work that we have to do around our ourselves as people and our organizations who are we how do we if we don't experience marginalization or oppression in a particular way then how do we contribute to that and what sorts of identities contribute to that so so that's a separate talk and then finally um i also talk about the outward gaze right which is we are a people who are a part of families who are part of communities who are part of states who are part of this nation, but we are also part of, of the world, right? So how do we think about the effects of our anti-racist work or our anti-sexism work or our anti-oppression work in our own community, right? I think about universities like Yale and Johns Hopkins, uh, you know, and Columbia University that are situated in what at least used to be um, really economically exploited areas that are full of people of color, that are full of people, um, you know, that you wouldn't ordinarily associate with an Ivy League school. What is the effect of what that university does inside on the community outside? And, and lastly, with regard to the upward gaze, you do realize that the, the, this anti-racism racism protest moment is global. So there are portraits of, of, of George Floyd on walls in Syria. There are portraits of George Floyd in India and Indonesia. There were huge protests in London where, um, you know, statues came down. So we need to be thinking about several things at once. Um, but I want to focus our attention on some of the uh, some of the, uh, the aspects of the upward gaze. So next slide. So. OK, so one of the things that I think is worth mentioning here uh, is why people aren't sort of engaging and starting and continuing conversations on race. And so let me just say this before I even get to this first barrier. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I am multiracial, I mix with black, and this is what I look like every day. Every time I step outside my house, um, I am essentially participating in racial dialogue because someone's going to ask me what I am, what my ethnicity is. Um, and every time I show up to a workplace, someone is going to be thinking about my what my femaleness, my blackness, my Asianness. Sometimes they think about the fact that I'm fluent in Spanish. So they're actually I got a job and they just said, listen, you know, we get a lot with you in one body. Right. So I just want to highlight the fact that every time I look 
leave my home since I was born. I've been participating in racial dialogue, racial uh, racial dialogue. So what a privilege it is to educate yourself about these issues as opposed to living them each day. Because in this body, I live this dialogue every day. So there's a there's a lovely quote here from a woman who's pre- protesting. And so I just want to point out that sometimes people are not starting these conversations and continuing them because they don't have to. If you are a primarily white organization, especially a white male organization, you may or may not feel like you want to start a, a, a conversation on race equity inclusion because that's not your everyday experience and that's not your professional experience. Next slide, please. Another barrier to people sort of entering this space is a fear of dread and failure and feeling woefully equipped. I cannot tell you how many men I have spoken to who say, I wanted to come to your women's thing or your women's panel or your women's event, but I don't know how I fit into that and I don't want to make things worse. My thing is just don't say anything, don't give any compliments, and then I'll just be over here on the sidelines, right? As opposed to saying, I'm a man and I don't identify as a woman, but how can I be helpful in the anti-sexist struggle, right? So a lot of times people don't start and continue these dialogues because they're afraid of being racist. They're afraid of being sexist. They don't know if they're going to make things worse and they don't know if they're going to do or say something wrong. What I want to say here is that what we don't have the luxury of doing, all of us, is nothing. That's not an option. You don't get to opt out. There's no third space. Audrey Lord reminds us that your silence will not protect you. So even if you don't identify as a as a black indigenous person of color or as a woman or or as on the LGBTQ plus spectrum, you have a place in this dialogue and you're probably the most important person in that dialogue because you have the power to create both sexist and anti-sexist conditions, racist and anti-racist conditions. This is one of those interesting paradoxes where you can be the problem and the panacea right at the same time and that's why we need everybody this is an all hands on deck exercise okay next slide all right and then finally the third barrier um is again we've got members uh, of empowered groups and people with the most power just like i said who don't know how and where they fit into this dialogue I just spoke to someone the other day who said, listen, we are an organization full of well-meaning white people, well-meaning straight people, well-meaning men. We have no idea what to do. Can you help us know what to do? Right. And then furthermore, there's sort of a nuanced question here, which which I've written an article about, actually. But it's about if I'm a man, why would I want to dismantle patriarchy? If I am straight, why would I want to dismantle heteronormativity? And if I am white, why would I want to dismantle uh, the very system that empowers me and privileges me every day? What is my motivation there? Who would want to do that? So that's almost a separate talk, but we can come back to some of those reasons why we would want to do that. But I just want to say that a, a strong barrier for people sort of having the most power, right, the most racial power, the most sexual identity power, the most gender-based power, is that they don't know where they fit, they don't know what to do, and they don't know why they would want to work against their own quote-unquote quote self-interest um and so we can talk about that all right next slide and we are we're at about i've got about 10 more minutes so we are inching closer um to some of our tips and uh, strategies uh work so one thing i want to say is a, a very popular talk that i give is called moving people from actors to allies to accomplices um and it's based on jonathan osler's framework of white accomplices so right and but, but what i love about jonathan osler's white accomplices framework is that you can apply that to any ism you can learn how to be not only an ally but an accomplice um along any identity you can learn how to be an accomplice for sexism an accomplice for racism an accomplice for ableism linguicism and some of the other isms that are out there. And I just want to say really quickly, I don't have time to sort of fully explicate the framework, but an actor is just someone who'll sort of listen and and absorb and say, wow, this is really terrible. Like they'll turn on the news and they'll see these racial protests and they'll say, that's that's really a problem, right? But an ally will say, no, I'll stand with someone. I'll go with someone. I'll go into an office and, and argue for more pay equity. I will go into an HR office and argue you know, against racist policies, right? So an ally is actually someone who's active, who's going to do something. An accomplice is sort of, in my view, 
one of the highest forms, uh, one of the highest shows of solidarity, because an accomplice will do something in service of social justice or racial justice without credit, without social media attention, without anyone knowing, and all by themselves. So this is a man in a meeting who will look at a woman and say, I'm sorry, you were interrupted. What were you going to say? Right. This is a white person in, in, in a board meeting who will say, does anyone else notice how no one else here is anything but a white and a man? Does anyone else see that as problematic? Well, I'm raising that flag at, by myself alone with with consequences. Uh, and we need to talk about that. Right. So that's an accomplice. So I just want to make sure that we're clear on the semantics of the framework. OK, next, as we inch toward the end. Um, okay, here we are. Now, recently I wrote a very popular article that's been shared about 150,000 times, and it's called um, I'm White and I'm Outraged by Ahmaud Arbery's Murder. Now what? A Practical Guide for White Allies and Accomplices. And in it, I talk about what to do, right? Like if you are a person who is part of an empowered group, specifically if you are white, what can you do in this moment? Because people are calling me and they're saying, I need to know. This is very self-explanatory, and I apologize for the textiness, but again, you can have access to the PowerPoint when we're finished. Um, I just want to encourage people to make sure they're starting with themselves, because part of the reason people feel so woefully ill-equipped to have this conversation is because they weren't taught about various histories. They weren't taught about the full human record. Um, and that's what I was tackling as a teacher, educator, and as a, as a teacher in education. We have a problem there. We know that. So I want to encourage people. I think I'm going to put together, you know, a syllabus for all of us at some point so that people can just say, if I never learned about racism and even my role in anti-racism, where do I go? What do I read? Right? In addition to Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility, Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, right? Secondly, I want to encourage people to start with stories. One very popular mechanism that people use at organizations is to highlight the stories of people who ordinarily don't get a chance to tell their stories. Now, that's we have to sort of balance a fine line there sometimes because you don't want to spotlight, which is, hey, it's Black History Month. Who do we have? What black person can we get in this organization to do all the work surrounding this uh, Heritage Month celebration? Right. That's spotlighting is different than highlighting. So I want to encourage you to seek out stories of, of people of color, what I call global majorities, right? And I want you to think about how you can learn more about what it's like to not be you, right? How you can develop that sense of empathy. Third, you know, what I'm very clear about at this point in my career is that statistics don't change minds and hearts. Stories do, right? But there are some people who have sort of that logical, mathematical intelligence at the forefront. And they're like, but can you show me, you know, can you show me institutional racism? Can you help me understand the data? And Dr. David Stovall, I love his quote. He says, yeah, because the data are on our side. When we think about the sentencing of black men and white men in the criminal justice system, you know, we, we know that they're about 20 percent longer, that those sentences are 20 percent longer. We know based on the Equal Justice Initiative that, that people who are black and African-American are far more likely to face stiffer penalties and even the death penalty. Right. We know in education that, you know, some of the issues of, of racism and equity there. Right. So some people still want those numbers. And I would encourage you to go and sort of get those numbers. And I've got some resources at the end that will lead you to that sort of data. And then this is the most important one, um, this, this penultimate point. It is, it is paramount that if you are a member, a member of an empowered group, especially if you are white, it is paramount that you start at home. OK, I cannot come to your dinner table and work with your children. I cannot go to your grandmother's house, irrespective of what words she used and how you know she's from a different time and a different era. And that's just what they said. And that's who they were. I can't talk to your grandma. I'm not there. And if I'm a woman of color, a person of color, I'm probably not even in your social circle. Right. Which is why white people are so um, quick to say, well, I have a friend who's black <laughs> right? because because usually you don't. You don't have a friend who's black usually. So what I need for people to do is is work with one another right if you're a man you've got to disrupt se disrupt sexism among men and if you're white you've got to disrupt what christine Sleater would call white racial bonding or sort of the assumed okayness of racism between white people you've got to respond to that 
um, with your own people, okay? Your elders, your children, and at your workplace, and at your place of worship, and in any organizations that you're a part of. You have to do that because I'm not there, right? And then finally, you've got to start at work. Now, we're here primarily to talk about organizations and how you can translate this information into what to do at work. Um, and I've got some more uh, information about that on the following slides. But again, if, if it costs you something to do this work at work, then that's probably an indication that your organization has an incredible amount of work to do or that you may need to take um, your anti-racism elsewhere. I hate to say that. OK, next slide. All right. So um, I just wanted to, you know, in the full presentation, you'll get there are several things that I've already written because 30 minutes is really not quite sufficient for us to go through. But I just want to remind us that we just lost an incredible social justice giant, um, Representative John Lewis. And I also want to remind us that, um, you know, I. I almost wrote an article called Same Story, Different Day, because I feel like I keep writing the same types of things about anti-racism over and over. I wrote this book chapter about a year and a half ago um, ab and about police brutality and about some of the experiences that my very dark skinned brother has had with police uh, and law enforcement. And I can't believe that this is getting new attention because now we're talking about that again in a different way. So I do hope that at some point um, I can you know, put myself out of business as it were but I, I'm never going to get tired of making good trouble. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so uh, this is actually one of the last slides because I'm going to wrap up here in about three minutes so we can get to our uh, wonderful Q&A. But I want to make sure that people leave here with a full sense of what to do. I want to make sure that people understand that when I'm coming in as a consultant or if you're going to embark on an anti-racist or an anti-oppression -op journey, you've got to do deep personal identity work as a person and also as an organization. And I'll talk about equity audits and that sort of thing in the Q&A. But I also want you to consider how you're going to do, do this work. And I would hope that you reshift to the upward gaze. I would hope that you look at the white people in your organization as key determinants of how your DEI efforts are going to go. I would hope that you look at the men in your organization as key players in anti-sexism. And I would hope that you look at, you know, the able-bodied people in your organization as key players in accommodations and making sure that you have, you know, you don't have ableism in your organization. Okay. Um, I also uh, just, oh, I want to make sure that people understand that it's a good idea to sort of choose someone who's a little far, a little farther along, you know, on the spectrum of anti-racism. I'm always advocating for mentors. Um, and then I also just want to make sure that, that, that you understand, again, that this is ongoing work. So I've talked about sort of, I'll talk a little bit more later about the discomfort of this work, but this work is somewhat unending. Although I will say this. Um, and then I'll do the last couple of slides. I am from the School of Critical Race Theory, right? And you, and many of you who know who is his work, uh, the work of Derek Bell, he says that, you know, he has a concept called racial realism. And he says that racism will never go away, right? Racism is permanent. It is a permanent, indisputable fixture of American society and probably the global society, and it will never go away. And I disagree. Um, racism is actually a learned behavior. There's nothing innate. We are not born being racist, right? We're born to sort of notice difference, um, which is why six month old can, you know, determine difference and two year olds, you know, have, have, have thoughts about different skin colors and they're asking questions, but there's nothing innate and permanent about racism. Anything that can be manufactured can be dismantled. Anything that can be learned can be unlearned and anything that can be fabricated can be destroyed. So I just want to make sure that we're clear that even though I'm saying you're constantly going to have to do this work, I do think that there is ultimate progress here. Okay, next slide, because I'm, I'm ending my time. So next slide. This is just, uh, there's a better slide that sort of points you to these Medium articles that I've written. My most recent one is, if you are more outraged by the destruction of property than the destruction of black lives, your outrage is misplaced. Uh, a helpful guide for white people who need proce help processing the protests. That's also on Medium. I've written a, an article about video classism and just sort of, you know, the assumption we're making about people's homes and letting people into our lives. Because as a woman of color, I don't need additional layers of scrutiny. Me, right? Like I'm already in this body, so I don't need additional layers of oppression and, and scrutiny. So those are just some resources. Next slide. Um, 
Yeah, and, and also organizations. I think this is a penultimate slide, but I just want to make sure that people are aware that you don't have to do this work alone. Even if you're the only person in your organization who's doing the work of racial justice, you can actually expand your network outside your organization and get help and wisdom there. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the last slide. And this is just to make sure people know how to contact me, right? Um, this 30 minutes has not been in any way sufficient for me to help really understand what your organization or you know what you're going through as a person. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, you can email me, you can call me, um, and we can sort of think through these issues together. Okay, that's my time officially. So I will turn it, over, turn it back over to Gloria Blackwell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tahari. Your time isn't all, totally over yet. <laughs> uh, thank you. I mean, just thank you so much for sharing your framework, you know, sharing the, the tips and the tools and, you know, giving us that broad understanding of sort of where we are now and what we can use to start opening up those conversations. Uh, your, your energy is absolutely terrific. And I don't know about everyone else, but I hope that everyone is giving you a virtual round of applause because it, that was an absolutely fantastic sort of entree so that people can begin thinking about what are those next steps. Uh, so we really wanna move now into responding to some of those questions that people very thoughtfully, thoughtfully presented uh, as they registered, and I know you've had an opportunity to take a look at them, so I'm just going to turn it back over to you so that we can address some of those questions. Thanks. Absolutely, and thank you. I, this this feels like a perfect uh, intellectual circle because the AAUW has supported my research, and it just feels so right that I'm able to now use that expertise to come back to the very community that that helped me become a diversity expert. So, just thank you for this opportunity. Um, someone posed a fantastic question um, prior to this uh, session. And I thought that I should answer this first because I have a quite substantive answer. Um, and the question is, where can primarily white organizations begin the work and what is the starting place? And so I've identified sort of a couple of different elements that are requisite to any organization. But because so many organizations have concentrations of whites and white males at the top of their organizations as tone setters and chief of their organizations, I think it's important to sort of start here. So I just want to Give, give an answer to where can primarily white organizations begin the work and where's the starting place? The ultimate starting place is professional humility. Um, professional humility is the ability of either a person or an organization to say, there's probably something I don't know. Um, there's probably something I don't know about the experience of being a woman, about the experience of being a person of color, about the experience of being economically exploited or experiencing co poverty, right? There's probably something, a perspective that I don't know. Um, I have the hardest times with people and organizations who have arrived. They, they're saying, no, we're good. We don't have anything to discuss. We don't have anything to do. And we especially won't learn from you. <laughs> we, I, we don't care that you have two degrees from Harvard and a PhD. We will not learn from you. And so professional hil uh, humility is really the, the, the prerequisite, right? An organization or a person has to be willing to say, there is work to be done here. And whether we want you here or not, we need you here. Thank you very much, okay? Secondly, um, resources. Everyone wants to do diversity, equity, and inclusion all, either on the cheap or on the free. You have no idea how many organizations come to me on a regular basis. And I'm not talking about nonprofit. You know, if you're a nonprofit and you serve homeless children, I will absolutely do something you for, for you for free. I've thrown up pro bono all day long, right? Um, but I, I mean, I, I talk to major corporations like a pharmaceutical company or a tech firm. I mean, and they'll say things like, oh my gosh, Dr. Jackson, the ways in which you could help us sound so fantastic. Will you do it for free? <laughs> And I mean, that is inherently problematic because first of all, I am a working poor professional and I have substantial student loan debt. So I sell my expertise and my ability to help you because that's what pays my mortgage and my student loans. So the other thing that's inherently problematic is that we take the labor of women and particularly women of color, the emotional labor, the actual labor, we take that for granted. So the second thing I want to say to that question is you're going to have to dedicate some resources, right? 
um, you're going to have to invest in yourself and you're going to have to invest in your organization because yes, I can do some things pro bono and for free, even though you should pay for it. Um, but, but the ways in which people prioritize race, equity, and inclusion at their organizations and the, the resources and the funds they dedicate to that, that says everything about the seriousness with which you're going to embark on that journey. So I'm always leery about companies who are asking me to do something for free, but, but they're a pharmaceutical company who can clearly afford to pay me my very modest rate, right? Um, the third thing I'll say here is I would, I would suggest that you do an internal equity audit. Um, you have got to be introspective. This is what I was talking about with regard to the inward gaze. You have got to be able to look at your leadership, your policies, your practices, the way you recruit, the way you even select people to interview, right? Like I'm a woman named Tahari. So despite the fact that I'm over-educated, over-experienced, and over-qualified, I'm going to get 50% fewer callbacks for jobs because I have an ethnic-sounding name. So that sort of awareness has to come to the fore. And then finally, I would suggest um, a commitment to action. So one of the things that happened, I was, I was leading a focus group at a biomedical research agency, and uh, they talked about how, you know, if you don't, if you don't take this information to our leaders, and, and if they can just ignore what we say, then you will have wasted our time, right? You will have rounded us up for three hours and you will have wasted our time. And I already have to deal with racism and do this job for less money if I'm a woman or a person of color. So now you've wasted my time, right? And I've also had, you know, people say, well, you know, I mean, it's all talk. And, it, you know, like you said at the top of the presentation, it's lip service, but they're not doing anything. So your organization has to be committed to making sure that, that diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are imbued into your organizational structure and your culture. One thing that came, I'll just say this really quickly and then I'll stop talking, but um, one thing that came out of that group, you know, this, these African-Americans who, who did this focus group for three hours, you know, biotech, you know, biomedical research, they said, um, if you are a leader in our organization, if you're like a white leader in our organization, and if you can summarily go down a hall and speak to all the white people and not acknowledge any of the people of the color or even any of the women, how are you able to keep your job? How are you able to remain a part of this organization? So when we think about strategic planning and when we think about even how we evaluate employees, um, when I was a professor, I said, you know, we should probably have a place in our tenure packet that talks about service to the creation and maintenance of a diverse community, because there are people who are doing that and not being compensated, and there are people who are not doing that, and they're being rewarded. So you've got to make an institutional commitment to action. So that would be my answer to the first question. Um, Gloria, should I continue answering questions? or? Yes, please continue. <laughs> Go right ahead. Okay, great. Okay, great. So, um, so someone else posed a question. This is really important um, because I, I mentioned, I broached the subject of comfort earlier, but I, I can answer this actually quite quickly because I know we're aiming to end it uh, soon. So the question is, how do you raise diversity, equity, and inclusion in a way that is non-threatening and garners buy-in of leaders for which it might be a new conversation? And the very first thing I want to say is, now I, I had the best job I've ever had uh, last year. I was working for a phenomenal leader um, at the Department of Defense. And one of the very first things I said to him was, um, well, sir, you know, I'm here to make everyone else here just a little bit uncomfortable. And he was such a phenomenal leader that he was unfazed by that. It's like, okay, you know, great. You know, but, but, what, but, what I, but my larger point there is that if, you're, if people aren't uncomfortable, um, you're not doing anti-oppression work. If people aren't completely threatened by something, you're probably not doing anti-racist work because inherent in this work is a challenge to a status quo, right? You've got to do things differently. These protesters, especially those long haul, uh, incredible protesters in Portland, they're making the point that we demand that you do something differently. We are physically not going home until something changes. So one of the pitfalls of doing diversity, equity, inclusion work is that if you're doing the work and everyone's still comfortable, if the men are comfortable, if the white people are comfortable, if the straight people are comfortable, if the cisgender people are comfortable, if, if, if native speakers of English are comfortable, if you're doing the work and everybody's comfortable, you're probably not doing the work. 
So, you know, I used to say you can only make as much progress within an organization as the wokest empowered person will allow you to. Right. Like you, if, you, if I can only go into a place and that will allow me to do work that keeps the men comfortable or the white people comfortable or whichever power in power group comfortable, I'm not really doing the work. And so I'll often end those contracts because I feel bad for taking the money. Right. So the first thing I'll say is you can't do this work and not be non-threatening. OK, you can't demand pay equity for women and not have that be uncomfortable. You can't demand a more belonging, a more belonging based and inclusive environment specifically for African-American employees or for people of color without making people uncomfortable. So we have to abandon this idea that we can sort of do anti-racism work light. Racism kills people. I mean, people are literally losing their lives because of racism. And that's that's important. So I just want to make the point that if you're trying to keep people comfortable, that's not possible. Um, and so I, I think, every, again, I, I told this incredible admiral that I used to work for, you know, sir, I'm here to make everyone here just a little bit uncomfortable. And I probably did that at that particular place. But I do that at every place because that's good diversity work. Everybody should be challenged. Everybody should be thinking about doing things differently. Because if they're thinking about just going home and doing the same thing over and over again, then you're just keeping racism in place. You're just keeping sexism in place. And that's not the work I do. So you'd probably have to call my colleague for that work. <laughs> um, okay, um, Gloria, should I continue? We have time for a few more. Should I continue? Yes, please do. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I think this is going to be the penultimate question uh, because I, I, I think I personally have two more questions that I want to answer and then, then I'll think we'll be right at six. Um, but so uh, someone is asking me, um, and is this, this is especially rel relevant for a university women group, but they're saying, what are the best practices to guide conversation, these conversations in our college classrooms? And then they're saying, thank you so much for your labor. Yeah, thank you so much for thanking me. Um, I want to just speak to educators for one second, even though I know everyone in the 1500 plus audience is not an educator. But one thing I used to say to my students is every institution has its bedpans. OK, At no institution is perfect. So I want to send you out to the most critically conscious, anti-racist, progressive organization in school. But that's not possible. It's your uh, onus to help make that true. Right. So I would say to them, every organization needs infiltration and every organization can be co-opted for good or evil. So one thing that I like to talk about with, especially within the, the sector of education is we are training the next generation of social change agents, right? Because there is progress, right? One of my favorite quotes is, you know, Martin Luther King who said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, right? So there are things I can do now that even my parents couldn't do. My father, a black presenting man, couldn't marry a white woman and move to the state of Virginia. I'm from Virginia, so I couldn't marry a white man. Well, in 2020, I can marry whomever I like. Right? That doesn't necessarily indemnify us from racism and discrimination on the street, right? but legally and technically, there is that progress. So I need for educators to understand that we, that education is, you know, as Joel Spring would say, it's the largest form of socialization within any society. Nelson Mandela would say it is the greatest weapon you can use, right, to, to change the world. And it's true. So if you are an educator, whether you're a classroom educator, whether you're a faculty member, I know we have some faithful professors on, online right now. I need you, however you actually engage in the conversation, and I can give you actual tips for how to start and continue that in a university classroom, in a P through 12 setting. I do that all the time. However you start the conversation, know why you're doing it. You're doing it to influence the next generation of, 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 of social justice change agents so they don't have to protest, right? Like the point is, the point is to get them to stop protesting. Just like my goal in life is to put myself out of business and to render myself irrelevant because there's no discrimination, there's no oppression, there's no sexism, there's no racism. Your job should be to put out the flame of oppression. And that's how we do that through education. So I just wanted to address that. And then um, if it's okay, I, I'm going to address one more question, and then I'll make sure I leave just a few minutes uh, for, for Gloria and Milan and, and the folks at AAUW. This is my favorite question because my expertise is in anti-racism and specifically white anti-racism. I am fascinated by white people who learn to not only sort of recognize the white racial experience, but who become anti-racist accomplices for other people. I am fascinated by those folks. 
The question is, what is the single most uh, important thing you wish that we white folks would do or know? Now, I've given part of this answer before, but I'm going to reiterate it here. If you know the work of Noel Ignatiev and John Garvey, they have a, a concept called race traitorship. And they talk about, it's very similar to Christine Sleater's uh, concept of white racial bonding, which is that when white people are so comfortable with racism that they start to, you know, that they share a joke with each other or they make a comment like, well, you know, the neighborhood's getting awfully dark, right? And they make that comment to another white people, the white person. What they're assuming is that number one, you agree, and number two, it's safe for you to say and do that. Same thing with men. If, if a man is in, with, with a group of men and he makes an off-color comment or if he objectifies a woman or if he's the police officer, you know, who shared this, this poor victim's, you know, explicit photos it, it, with other men, he's assuming that the other men who are looking at those photos with him, number one, positively sanction that and that they're totally okay with it. What I need white people to do is to disrupt racism with other white people, right? I need, yes, it's great that you're protesting out in the streets. Please continue to show us solidarity. It's great that you're being phenomenal educators. Absolutely, I need you on the front lines there. But I need you to work with other white people. That is the single most important thing. It's almost like the uh, W.E.B. Du Bois concept of each one teach one, the talented 10, right? If you understand racism and if you're on this journey toward anti-oppression and anti-racism, I need you to take at least one other white person with you because there are not enough of us. Physically, there are not enough people of color to take uh, everyone along with us. So that is that is what I'd say. I just need I need people in empowered groups to use their power for good um, and just watch how well you sleep at night. That's what I'd say to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson. That, that was a very powerful, powerful presentation. And I love the, the ending is the need for white people to disrupt racism with other white people. And that's very specific, actionable advice for folks. I know that we probably could go on for another 12 hours. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time out to, uh, to be with us. It's really been fantastic taking the time, sharing your expertise. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, right, this isn't the first conversation, this isn't the last conversation, and we appreciate you providing us with, with a framework so that people can sort of get a, a feel of what those conversations might look like, and also sharing some resources so that we can go out, look for the resources, have some conversations with folks on how you might start thinking about um, doing this kind of work. And, and it's been very, value, very valuable. We can see in the comments, we can see in the chat uh, that everyone is very grateful, very thankful for this work that you are doing. And also, I think all of us know that this is an opportunity to implement real change, right? No one wants to go back to pre-pandemic and, you know, pre-protest life, right? This hopefully will be a seismic shift. Uh, we will be sending out uh, uh, information about the webinar. Uh, everyone who registered will be getting a copy of the full PowerPoint, as Dr. Jackson mentioned, which has more resources, more information on the articles that she mentioned. Um, we definitely condensed it a bit for our time this evening. The, the will be posted on the AAUW website, so definitely um, look for that as well. Uh, You'll, you'll be getting a survey. We'd really love to hear more of your thoughts about how uh, you felt that uh, this particular um, conversation uh, went because we really want to hear from you and find out um, what other topics people are, are interested in as well. Uh, and questions about this and any other webinars, please send an email to equity at aauw.org. Uh, and we'd like to thank ICO once again for helping uh, support this webinar. Um, those of you who are attending, um, we'd like to ask you also to support uh, efforts like this and you'll be receiving a, a donation link will pop up and we hope that whatever you can give, uh, we certainly appreciate it so that you can help us continue to bring fantastic experts on topics um, 
uh, like were just presented by uh, Dr. Tahari Jackson. Uh, you'll have her contact information in all of the information that you'll receive and in the video. Um, and uh, I know Dr. Tahari, you will be getting a lot of people who will want to connect with you. Uh, but, <laughs> but we really appreciate the time that you have spent with us. And I want to let you have the last word. Oh, oh my God. Thank you so much. Um, I, I don't want to ever hold people's, uh, people hostage, but, um, you know, I, it means everything to me that you would give me this forum. Um, as someone who is the child, uh, I'm a descendant of an American slave. I am the daughter of an immigrant whose English, you know, who, whose language, first language is not English. I grew up poor. And so the fact that I can use the totality of my experience and translate that into helpful wisdom for other people is probably the best way I know how to co-opt the unique combination of my identities. Um, thank you for allowing me to share my experience. Thank you for supporting the development of my expertise. I'm an expert only because I did grant funded research. And thank you for allowing me to say what needed to be said. I just hope that people out there are willing to do what needs to be done. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Tahari. And thank you, everyone who participated. Have a great evening.